and welcome to Vista Talks, interesting discussions with interesting people from all around the world. Hello and welcome to Vista Talks, interesting discussions with interesting people from around the world. I'm your host for today's show, Simon Hodgkins, and I'm joined in studio by James Hadley. James is the Usher Assistant Professor in Literary Translations at Trinity College Dublin. You're very welcome, James. Hello, thank you very much. So let's move on and get on to the show. Uh, James, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, your, your own educational background, and how you ended up in this wonderful industry uh, uh, in relation to languages and all the way up to your current position in Trinity College here in Dublin, Ireland. Okay. Um, so if I go right the way back, um, the first thing that I think about is that I was a really odd child because um, when everyone else was out playing football, I was the one who decided as about a 13-year-old teenager that I wanted to learn Japanese. And um, okay. so I was sitting in my bedroom learning Japanese. <laughs> and uh, so that kind of interest just stuck with me. So all the way through school and through um, uh, right up until university, I was just teaching myself Japanese the whole time. I didn't have any classes. And then uh, when it came to university time, it was obvious that I wanted to do Japanese. And But my mother said, you can't just do a language because you'll never do anything with that. So you have to do it with something else. So I did Japanese and computing. I combined the two. Wow. And when people, when I say that to people, they normally say, well, how do those two things go together? Yeah. They don't really. But um, in many ways, they, they've kind of given me complementary skills, which I now use. Um, and I can, th there can't have been many 13-year-old uh, boys in Scotland self-studying Japanese at no. that time, James. Would that be fair? That's right. No, I was really strange. And my, te uh, my teachers thought I was a really odd child. But I had to... Um, I had, was doing French at school as well, and I was quite good at that. And uh, so I just kind of did the Japanese as a, as a, a pastime. I was odd. There's no, there's no way of putting it a different way. But, um, but you obviously had a passion and yeah, an interest in I was it obsessed. From, from an early age. I was completely obsessed with yeah. it, yeah. and not just the language, but also the culture. It just because it was so, so different from anything I'd experienced personally. Yeah, it kind of captivated. And were me. there any outside influences that, that what you were sort of drawing on at that young age, or was it just something you'd seen on, or heard on radio or television yeah. or on print, or it was things that I'd seen. Um, and it's the kind of thing that once you start looking for it, you find more and more. So I, I think I'd seen something in a book right. one time and it was kind of romanticized Japan. And I thought, this is amazing and I have to learn more. So you were hooked and on languages hooked. From, from that stage on and continues exactly. today. So that, that brings us up to, I suppose, your, your, your initial interest in languages. But tell us a little bit about your role today, because obviously working with Trinity College, which is known around the world, mm. it's one of the leading educational institutions yeah. globally. Uh, tell us about your role today and what, what, you, what are you actually involved in there at Trinity College, James? Okay, well, I'm the director of the MPhil in Literary Translation, which is a master's degree for people who are training to be um, translators or people who are just interested in learning about translation theory. And apart from that, I also do research and I also teach, I'm the main teacher on that course as well. So um, I reached this stage having uh, also, um, I lived in Japan for a while and I also lived in China for a while and in China I taught a very similar course, but it's a very, very different thing doing it here right. from okay. in China. Okay. Um, in that uh, the students in China tend to, um, that there's huge classes to start with, and they're very, very focused on where is this going to get me. Whereas yeah, here, very career focused exactly. from, a very, from the early start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're they're used to being kind of ranked, so they know exactly where they fall in the class and where that's going to lead them. Whereas okay. here, um, they tend to be much more relaxed okay. about what the next step is. They would like to know what the next step is. But really, they tend to focus on the course and learning what they can learn for the kill, uh, for the for their own sake on the course. Okay. Um, so that's a that's a huge differentiator, isn't it? Yeah. Very different 
sort of mental approach to yeah. the, to the learning, I suppose. That's right. Um, but the university cultures are just dramatically different, and I yeah, guess that yeah. drives things. Yeah. Okay. And so let's let's talk about the course in a little bit more detail. Then, so you know, how long have Trinity College been running this course? How long have you been involved in it yourself? And I'm I'm interested to understand a little bit about you know the, the intake of students on an annual basis. You know, how how big is it? You know, what's the outturn like? How many graduate? But also, uh, once we cover that sort of area, I'm very interested to find out how are you actually teaching translation in this complex you know, uh, massively expanding digital mm. content world. Yeah. Um, you know, how you go about teaching translation today to uh, students who have all got smartphones and apps and distracted right. by digital content <laughs> left, right and centre. Right. But you're having to teach people about the, the art and the science of translation. Mm. So tell us a little bit about the course, uh, the student intake, and how you actually manage to teach translation in, in today's marketplace. Okay. Well, the, the course that we have has been running for well over 10 years. It's been going for quite some time, and um, but I haven't been running it that long. Okay. I've only been at Trinity for two years. Um, okay. This is coming up to my third year that we're starting now. And um, so the students, we generally have around 10 students in each year, which is not a big number. And we purposely keep it so that we we're getting the cream of the students that are applying and we're also getting those who are just desperate to learn about translation so we could we could open the doors and allow lots of amazing students to come in who are actually great on paper but not necessarily that interested in translation for its own sake but we focus on the ones who just are in love with this subject and um, so because we only have a small group that means that we have time to spend with each individual person which we find really important and so the course itself is split up into about three different aspects one is the theory that you touched on one is professional and one is just the practical um, action of what does it mean to translate so the theory, as you might expect, we go through um, historical timelines right the way back to Cicero and the early translators of Rome and so on. Okay. And right the way up until the 20th century when um, translation studies came into being. That was around the World War II kind of time. Because of the Nuremberg trials, they suddenly needed all these translators in a way that they didn't in the past. Um, and at the same time, we introduce people to, well, how have people discussed translation in the past? And what does theory mean in the, in the sense of translation? It's quite different from when you're talking about the theory of gravity or something like this in a scientific field. Um, and at the same time, we teach the students how to analyze someone else's translation. So they can look at a source text and they can look at a translation and they can say, oh, right, you've done this strategy and here this is a slightly different thing and you might have achieved this if you've done it like that. So we really build in a sense of criticality into the students so that they can not only analyze other people's work but they can keep analyzing their own work and keep making it better. Which brings us straight into the professional side which um, we constantly keep an eye on what translation companies are doing and what they want. From, uh, from graduates because obviously most of our graduates want to become translators or want to be involved in the translation um, industry. So we teach them about project management and we teach them about well um, kind of the skills involved in living up to deadlines and uh, obvious research um, skills like using dictionaries and this kind of thing. And then uh, as far as the practical thing goes we, um, we focus on literary translation, of course, but that doesn't mean just novels and poems. For us, literature is anything that includes crit um, creativity. So we also teach them about subtitling and how to do subtitling, and we teach them kind of how they would um, translate for computer games and how they do advertising. Anything that involves a human element, we'll teach them. But uh, obviously, most of the industry today is is driven and dominated by uh, computer-aided translation tools. So we also teach them about that, so that they're not completely 
um, at sea when it comes to going into the industry. They have already these skills. They're learning the cat tools. They're understanding right. the, how the human and the and the um, language industry tools all work together. Exactly. They've got the project management skills. They're they're learning about deadlines. So it's it seems very very well rounded. A couple of words that you touched on there. Um, Criticality mm. and love. Uh, <laughs> so, to me, the way you're describing that is that the, the sort of this small group of um, translation students really must have the passion yeah. and the desire for this. That seems to be the sort of almost the selection criteria. I may be using the wrong term. No, but you're right. You're working with people that have a true passion, a true love for this um, type of work. That's right. And I think that actually most translation professionals will be doing it mostly because of a passion for what they're doing it's not really the most lucrative career in the world um, but if you if you love what you're doing then it can really make make a, a hugely uh, rewarding career for someone so we think it's ethical most ethical to um, bring the students um, that are already have this passion along into into the industry sure sure okay thank you and in terms of the actual students then that, that you're working with closely at uh, trinity college what's the what's the, what's the profile like mm -hmm. you know where where are these uh, guys and girls from um, what's the what's the profile type mm. that's actually really difficult to answer because yeah. they they literally come from the four corners of the earth okay we um there's no year that um, I, I've looked back through the records and there's no year where it's predominantly any country to be honest. Okay. Um, so obviously some years we have more Spanish speakers or more French speakers or something but you can expect to find them coming not only from Spain but they might come from South America as well. This year we've had three Brazilians and we've had Chinese students and French students and they just come from everywhere and I can't even narrow it down in terms of age because some of them come straight from their undergraduate yeah. and many don't. Many have uh, finished their undergraduate degree and then worked for a couple of years and then they come back to school. Others, they retire and then they decide they want to do a degree. So it's really, it's just completely mixed. Yeah. The only thing that links them is their passion for the subject. I was going to say that. So I mean, I mean regardless of language, locale, yeah. culture, any other type of demographic or, or way that you would, would look at a pie chart for students <laughs> uh, in sort of uh, educational uh, mm. facilities. Um, it, it's really the passion that's driving it, isn't yeah, it? that's um, right. Which makes it quite hard to it, market, actually. Because... Hard to market <laughs> and, and, and quite unique, I would, I would yeah. suggest, uh, because it's a real uh, passion for the subject, mm. uh, a love for the subject, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of the... Um, the students then they're choosing it obviously because it's a, it's a true passion it's what they want to do and mm -hmm. you, you touched on earlier a little bit about um, why they do it but from a career aspiration perspective mm -hmm. they, they're looking to work with uh, translation companies localization service providers industry uh, technology platform providers possibly like what from first hand, what is the career aspirations? Where are these students going on to? What are they doing once they finish their uh, degree? Mm. Many of them, uh, so almost all of them have done some kind of language degree to begin with. Yeah. Um, not necessarily, they could have done basically any subject that, that uh, would prepare them for the course, yeah. as long as they, they speak more than one language yes. to a really high level. Um, but so a, a language degree in itself doesn't really prepare you for, for much really in the real world so that they're looking they're passionate about languages they like translating and they want to know what can i do with this so they come to us and we really build a whole portfolio of skills in them and we don't funnel them into one direction or the other we don't say okay do this course and you will be a translator we don't say um you're going to be you're going to be only translating this kind of text instead we say right this is how you translate this is how you could translate this is what project management is this is the whole life cycle of a, a project this is the whole range of different careers you could aspire to take your pick basically you you can um, model the degree around your own interests so the real practical applications i suppose hmm. of the uh, the life cycle yeah 
okay and um, people in terms of uh, moving on uh, they uh, move into different careers uh, and again back to the, the uh, all around the world I assume yeah. um, but yourself uh, James obviously being really at the the cutting edge of this you, you, I know you're involved in research which we'll come on to in, 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 in a little while but I'm interested in your, your own personal views on translation because we've talked a little bit now about your background we've talked a little bit about um, you know the course and the, and the students and how you teach translation in today's um, complex world but I'm interested in your own views on translation uh, particularly around um, I suppose that debate between human translation yeah. machine translation uh, neural machine translation and what are your own views on, on, on that uh, as a, uh, somebody involved in educating people in the subject yeah I think um, um, technology is something that we it surrounds us all now and especially the students who are coming straight from their undergraduate um, degrees, they're digital natives, really computers and, and software are nothing to be afraid of for them. And for me as well, I, I actually, part of my research focuses on the, the applications of machine translation. So there's this recurring debate about will the machines kind of wipe us out as translators? Will they replace us? anytime soon I really don't see that happening for the next quite a long while because of the way that machine translation works so you need in order for a machine to translate something it needs huge amounts of kind of existing examples to go on and if there are no human translators working then the machine has no examples to go on so um, as it works now I think we're safe and actually the tools make uh, our lives much easier they mean that we can be a whole lot more productive our day can be filled we can we can actually earn a whole lot more because we can produce a whole lot more translations um, and they can also make our translations more accurate so the machine translation tends to be extremely good with um, finding the right term in the right place and a human brain can only hold so many technical terms so if you've got this kind of additional help why would you turn it down okay. thank you uh, so real complimentary uh, <laughs> answer there in terms of the two uh, the humans and the machines working together I think so. um, mm. in terms of uh, your own research let, let's talk about that mm. a little bit because I know you are doing some fascinating research on uh, indirect translation mm. so let's explore that a little bit and find out exactly what your research is, is around yeah so um, when I say, I, oh yes, I work on indirect translations, almost everybody's eyes glaze over and they've never heard of what this is. But it, all it is, is translations of translations. So what happens is if you don't have the expertise to translate from one language to another language, then you have to translate into a third language and from that third language, you translate into the target language. So for example, if you want to translate something from Irish into Latvian, there's not very many translators who can do that. And especially if the document is very technical or has kind of a legal aspect or is a kind of any way technically difficult, then you're going to struggle to find someone who can do it. So what, uh, many, um, what happens many times is that first, the Irish text would be translated into a, a language that more people speak which is normally English in practice. And then from English, it will be translated into Latvian. And so my research is looking at when this happens, which is actually a lot. It's not something that happens just kind of every now and again. When this happens, uh, what is essentially lost in the process? So you can imagine if someone's talking about a specific kind of hat or food or place in the source text, then along the journey, as it's being translated into language two and from language two to language three, they, these specificities might be lost. So one of the translators might decide, well, it doesn't matter if people know the exact name of the hat, it's a hat, so I'll just say hat. And then the second translator, when they come along, they don't have access to that, the name of that hat. So now it's just a hat. And then the eventual translation is somehow impoverished because it has less cultural specificity. 
So um, this is something that you can see I'm doing um, a wide range of research looking at all sorts of different languages and um, translation, indirect translations into those languages and via those languages. And you can see it basically looking across the world, across time. I focus at the moment on literature and that really gives you a, um, a, a specific, like a really good um, base of evidence because literature, as you know, tends to be really rich in terms of cultural specificity and um, also um, kind of um, syntactical nuance and this kind of thing. So it means that um, there's a lot of chance for the translator to simplify things. And I want to see, well, do they do that? And if they do, why? Um, and that brings me onto the machines, because it's one thing to look at how humans do it and see, OK, well, is this something that's just in our psychology? But then if you compare it with machines, you can see, well, actually, it might just be a feature of translation. It may just be something we have to live with or there might be strategies to get around it. Sounds like uh, quite a wide it's topic. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. It sounds <laughs> like there's an awful lot to be uh, understood there in yeah. terms of that research. How, how far into it are you or when did you just kick it off? Uh, it's only been the last couple of years that okay. I've been working on this. Okay. And so far I've focused only on literature text, literary text done by humans. But I'm now teaming up with um, machine translation scientists, so people who actually do this all the time. They just they just program machines to translate, and so now we're we're working together to create these huge corpora that are necessary. Um, so huge bodies of texts that allow you to compare these um, various translations and say, in a statistical sense, right, this text is. N so much percent normal <laughs> so it sounds really odd to say a text is normal or not normal what does normal mean it means well we can compare any translation with all the other texts that are written in that language and then um, we can look at uh, how people use a language so for example in English do we have an average sentence length of about 20 words well we do and then, so we can see, has someone translating from Spanish, which tends to have a much longer sentence length, have they shortened it to make it sound more English? Or have they kept it as it was to make it sound more Spanish? So when you have these huge bodies of text, you can look at things statistically and you can say, okay, it's this much normal, um, which is something that actually is lacking in a lot of translation theory up until now. So I'm really keen to push that forward. And in terms of uh, completing the research, is there a timeline <laughs> on that or is that just an open-ended question at this stage? I don't imagine it will be complete during my career. <laughs> uh, but uh, what's amazing about, uh, as you said, it's a huge topic. It's huge, yeah. What's amazing about it is that you start off thinking, oh, this is enormous. And then the more you dig into it, the bigger it gets. Okay. So, um, like, there are questions like, well, does it matter who you're translating for? So if it's children's literature, does that change things? Uh, if it's poetry, does that change things? Uh, does it matter if the languages are related or not? Does it matter if um, you're translating between cultures that have had a lot of contact or have no contact? So um, There are subsets within subsets within subsets. It's going to go on and on. Yeah. And on. Yeah. But the great thing is that... Um, PhD students are starting to become interested in this now okay. so uh, it won't just be me and my small team it will gradually hopefully become an actual uh, research theme and then hopefully we can yeah. actually develop tools that will, will help practicing translators from this incredible yeah fantastic <laughs> fantastic topic um, so in terms of uh, other areas then, just to, as we come towards the end of our discussion here today in the studio, uh, I know you're part of the centre mm. at uh, Trinity. I'd like you to just tell us a little bit about that. And any other sort of projects that you're working on with the university mm. uh, or in your career that you think uh, would be of interest to our audience? Okay, yes. Um, so yes, I, I'm based at the Trinity Centre for Literary and Cultural Translation. Uh, which is, it's just outside the, the gates of Trinity College. 
and it's really new we've only had the building for a couple of years but it's a lovely Georgian building and it brings together three partners so one is Trinity College one is uh, Literature Ireland which is Ireland's kind of outreach, outreach um, organization for literature they, they, their whole role is to promote and facilitate translations of Irish literature into different languages and the third is Dolky Archive Press which is a, a huge publisher of um, world literature in English so we have really all three directions and these partners all are based in the building and we work together on various um, outreach activities and we're just a really great partnership so um, what we're trying to do just now is we've set up the partnership we've set up the building we've got everything in place now we're trying to get the research culture um, we have the students already but we're trying to get the actual activities going and we really need to know, get people in Ireland and around the world to know that we're here and to come to us because it's amazing once you start talking about translation how many people are just fascinated by it people may never have even heard someone talking about translation in its own um, for its own sake because so often we see uh, a review of a translation and they don't even mention that this book came from another language they might just mention oh by the way it's translated from Swedish or something and isn't isn't the Swedish book great they just miss out the fact that actually there was a whole process in turning this Swedish book into English or whatever other language and the book you're reading is not the same as the, the original text it's interesting you, you say that because I, I was I've had a few discussions with Literature Island and um, I was fascinated to learn that they have already translated almost 2,000 works of Irish literature. So you start at James Joyce and you work <laughs> your way through, yeah. right up to modern authors. Yeah. And I was uh, really intrigued to learn that they've already translated over you know these 2,000 works yeah. into about 52 languages at this stage, which it's, is incredible. It's bewildering. We, yeah. we have in the boardroom at the centre, we have their archive. So it looks like a library, it's, it's enormous. Okay. Um, so all around all the four walls, uh, Literature Island's books translated into every language you can think of. And it's all Irish literature. And it's not just the classics, it's not just Joyce and, and um, the old guys. Authors, it's yeah. as you say, yeah. 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 Every year they publish a catalogue of books that have been that have come out in Ireland, which they then send around the world, and then practicing literary translators think, okay, well I can translate some Irish literature, and they can see exactly what books there are. So it's a great tool, really. For incredible, people. incredible. Well, James, it's been an absolute pleasure Likewise, to have you, you here in the studio with us today. <laughs> Uh, a fascinating uh, background in terms of how you ended up in this, you know, from the, the early age of studying <laughs> Japanese in your bedroom <laughs> to a true passion for language. I'm sure the, the computer science along the way helped tremendously, it does help. <laughs> uh, particularly with that uh, very large research project that you're involved in. Yeah. Um, I, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today thank you. and for sharing with us all the wonderful work that you're doing down there at Trinity College. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. <laughs> So uh, that's the end of today's uh, show with James Hadley from Trinity College Dublin. Please tune in again to see the next Vista Talk show where we'll be discussing more interesting discussions with interesting people from around the world. Thank you, James. Thank you.